Thank you very much. Thank you. Wait until the end of the talk to, to, to clap. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's a real pleasure to see Stefan again, and thank you all of you for the invitation and being here. Um, essentially, the, the topic of my talk will be the arrow of time, which is a very peculiar topic. I will not solve it. What I am planning to do with you today is to think about this for a while together. And the way I plan to do this is we'll start very, very slowly, very simple, thinking together. And at some point, around half of the talk, I will start showing you what we did on this topic. And that will be more specific, less general. And hopefully at the end, we will reconnect and discuss together the, the conclusions of the talk. OK? So let's start slowly. What is the arrow of time? The arrow of time is this. <laughs> you, can, you, can clearly, you can clearly distinguish. Let me, let me uh, have the right bottom. Yeah, we can clearly distinguish past for present, despite the fact that the laws of physics do not. And that's a puzzle, right? Because you know that when you study your first year of physics, the first problem that you solve is the pendulum, the harmonic oscillator. Sidney Coleman says that theoretical physics is the many ways you can use the harmonic oscillator to solve something, right? Or something like that. So we know that according to the laws of physics, if I put this oscillator to oscillate, starting it from some position will oscillate forever and it will never decay. There will be no past or present. We will not be able to distinguish one from the other. A little more insight into this we will gain if instead of having one only harmonic oscillator, we have three. What happened in that case is that, sorry for my bad drawing, I was lazy to calculate this exactly, <laughs> but you know how to do it, hopefully. And you know that there will be some recursion after some time. It looked like we will have some arrow of time because this is after this. However, at some point, we have again the same, and we cannot distinguish the past from the present. However, however, and I will go because if we continue with finite numbers, we are not going to get that far in the time of a lecture. If I put an infinite amount of oscillators and I do the same trick, I start the first oscillator from a, out of equilibrium and let it go. And I am a person, an animal that doesn't look around. I am very focused, myopic. And I believe that my universe is only this pendulum that I am touching and measuring. What I will see is this solution. The pendulum will start oscillating, and I will very well distinguish the past from the present because my pendulum will never come back. Trivial, right? What happened here? Well, what I did was to connect my very simple system, my very pendulum at the center, with something that drags the energy out of infinitum and I lose, I lose it. You can connect that with when matter interacts with light and light goes away and also introduces an asymmetry, a way to go to the infinite and disappear. And of course, this is a little tricky because this is too simple to explain the arrow of time. However, it's good to start simple because this has a lot of ingredients that we can consider that any system that shows irreversibility should have. And those three ingredients are these three. First of all, I have to have a, a very peculiar initial condition. I didn't put this infinite mass in a normal mode. Of course, this infinite chain of, of oscillators has a normal mode. And I excite the normal mode and will be a normal mode forever. Well, you cannot ask me to bring a very simple example and not having this type of things, right? I have to start my system in a very low entropy, in a very peculiar initial state, and then let go my system. Second, I have to have a projection, because if I am able to look at all the masses all the time, controlling all degrees of freedom, I will never see that energy goes away. I will always be able to track where the energy went. It will be like 
be have been cuts because the energy will go on all the masses, but they will be going somewhere. So I need to be myopic. I need to have a projection. And the other thing that I have to have is some limiting process. No finite systems will show this decay. With those ingredients in mind, we are now able to think how can we bring irreversibility in more complicated systems? And this is what we are going to do together. Right? At any moment, you can ask me any question that comes to your brain, to your mind, in such a way that we keep this as a conversation and as a dialogue. And the worst thing that can happen to me is that you, I lose you and you, don't, you lose interest in talking to me. So don't let that happen and interrupt me at any moment, please. So essentially, then, this is all good, but this is classical. And when I did that projection, I used the fact that the classical variables, I can ignore them very easily. Let's think what happens when we go to for the quantum mechanical case. In the quantum mechanical case, if I want to do the same solution of this problem, what I will grab is the, the operator that determines the position of the particle at zero, and I will have a trace into some initial state defined by the density matrix rho. This is graduate, graduate quantum mechanics one, right? Essentially, I start my system. This rho zero there is represented by this theta zero here is represented by this rho. And then I evolve my operator in time if I am using the Heisenberg picture, or I can, of course, using the trace, I can put this here and evolve by state, if I'm using the Schrodinger picture, doesn't matter. And I evolve the state, and I will write this evolution in this peculiar form that will help me later to do the math in a simpler way. So what I cre will create is this super operator, the Liouvillian, that essentially does the same as the Hamiltonian, this rotation in time that is produced by the quantum dynamics. The problem I have here, to repeat the trick that I did, for the classical chain of oscillators, is that if I want to remove the degrees of freedom that I do not want to see, there are degrees of freedom that I will not look at, right? Because I am myopic. I, I want to see a certain part of my system. I am an experimentalist looking at that one MV center in a sample, one impurity in a sample. And I have instruments, I have neighbors, I have rain outside. I don't want to see that. I want to see my MV center and see how light comes out of that MV center. So I have to be myopic. The way to do my, myopic in, in quantum mechanics, well, if you want to ignore your neighbors, it's easy. They are classical. You ignore them. But if you have photons, they are everywhere. And these are degrees of freedom that you want to ignore unless you are doing optics. So my problem there is that although I can use a local operator, I will have to deal with a global Hilbert phase. And it's not easy. Uh, I had a colleague in uh, gravitational theory in Penn State that repeats over and over this, Eugenio Bianchi, you may know him. He says, it's not easy to cut a Hilbert phase. And it's true, it's not easy to have, not only because they are infinite dimension, but it's not easy to cut a Hilbert phase. What I will propose you today to tackle that problem is to use a technique that is called a projection. And with use, using that projection, what we will do is to be able to not cut the Hilbert space, but essentially what we will do is to learn not to look at certain parts of the Hilbert space, but consider the fact that they may influence our dynamics. And this is what we are going to do together. So finally, after this slow introduction, the title of my talk. And with the title of my talk, I want to not only tell you that the way we do use this projection is we end up with something that is called the Langevin equation, a generalized Langevin equation, and I will show you what is that. This work was done in collaboration with two graduate students at Penn State. He's already graduated. Cristobal is working on some extension of this theory. And as I will show you, the reason why I am thinking about this, not only because it's a very interesting topic in physics, and because it happens that uh, we all age, and it's interesting to learn 
what is this arrow of time. The other thing that I will show you, is this is related to a very important practical application, which is if you have a cable and you inject a current or start all the electrons in a cable with a given current, you let it go, the current stops because there is resistance. The arrow of time again. But in this case, it's showing us that it, has made, it may have some importance for transport coefficients. Or for example, I hit the wall and the wall dissipates and goes away and it never hits again. Again, a transport coefficient. And remember, I was working on thermoelectrics in Oak Ridge. So I want to have, I am thinking about these topics, not only because they are interesting in physics, but because also I want to see applications of these concepts. And I belong to, a, just by chance, I belong to a community that develops codes that I will show you about, that essentially we say that you tell me where your atoms are, what type of atoms you have, and I will tell you the properties of that material. And we have very good theories to determine the properties of these materials in the ground state. What is the crystal structure, for example? I will show you an example. But typically, experimentalists do not like the, word, the ground state. They like to kick things and look how things react. And in that reaction is where you learn about your material. And every time you create an excitation, what happens? There is decay. And that decay determines if your excitation receives a name, like a phonon, or it doesn't deserve a name because it doesn't, it dissipates so fast that not even a name deserves. All that speech is to explain you why I have these extra authors here that are very important in all this, because I think I create the theory, I do the equations, I do the math, and then somebody incorporates that into the codes. And these are the people that are doing that. In two of the, these the DFT codes that are exciting and power flow, you don't need to know those acronyms if you don't care. So our menu, what we are going to do today, is I will give you a brief motivation of why I am going to talk about these topics into the DFT, density functional theory, and what is this. And then I will tell you why I have problems with one typical way of dealing with dissipation, that is the Boltzmann equation, is a fabulous beginning of this topic. Boltzmann was the guy who was started to think why it is that if I open that fire extinguisher there, the gas will occupy all this, and he was trying to push the idea that that gas is form of little atoms and particles, they didn't believe him, he committed suicide. Great equation to see the arrow of time. He was obsessed with the arrow of time. He gave an explanation about the arrow of time. It's a good explanation, but it's classical. If I want to go to quantum mechanics, the next step is to do the Kubo formula. I will tell you what is the Kubo formula, and I will give you a brief explanation of the Boltzmann. But the Kubo formula has problems too, and I hope to explain you those problems. And then I will provide the solution that we are working on. So let's work. If I keep talking and I don't go on to this program, we will never finish. So let's try to figure out the following. First of all, I told you, you tell me where the atoms are. You tell me if they are hydrogen, if they are titanium, oxygen. I need to know where they are. What is, I can calculate the charge density of them, which is this bluish cloud. And we use a theory that is density functional theory. It means you tell me where they are, you tell me the density, and I tell you the energy. And because I can search for the density that minimizes that energy, I can find the ground state density. And if I can find the ground state density, I can check different positions of atoms and determine which position is the most stable, the one that we will see in experiment. All this is ground state, and it works very well. So well that I was lucky to, for example, think about this material as a possibility. This is graphene in the gray carbon atoms. And I thought that if you put hydrogen in one carbon atom, one hydrogen per carbon atom, this material may be something stable. I did a calculation and I found that it was very stable, so stable that as I told you, we can put a name to things that are stable. And we name it graphene, which is a natural name 
for something that is a hydrogenated graphene in the same way that ethene, right? When you hydrogenate it, it forms ethane. This paper, nobody pay attention, but at some point, some experimentalists in Manchester, that they are with the discoverers of graphene, discovered my material, and they cited my paper, and everybody put attention. But the only reason I, I'm telling you this is that we can predict materials with this, right? And there is now a, a whole industry of predicting. This was so only interesting because, first of all, it was a stable compared to many substances that you know in nature, and at the same time, it was an insulator. So suddenly you have a material like graphene that is the best conductor ever, two-dimensional, and you put hydrogen on it and it becomes transparent. But if you can shape the hydrogen in certain places, you can create channels of conductor. And that was a paradigm that never happened because it's difficult to... Just two years ago, the first sample of this material was created. And we don't know how to remove the hydrogen now from that. But anyhow, anyhow, ground state, check. We are okay. Now, we have these electronic structure codes. There are like probably 30 or 50. You can buy them. You can have the illusion of doing science now because you put the, the, the code in your program and you put the atom somewhere and you get beautiful pictures, color pictures that the one I show you. They have names that you see there written in my bad hand, handwriting. And the ground state works pretty well, unless you want to do polonium oxide or uranium oxide. Other materials work perfectly well. However, as I told you, the experimentalists like to excite things. And with excitations, it comes irreversibility, dissipation, decoherence. Then we need to do more work, because we do not need how to treat this decoherence, this dissipation properly. And this is the topic of our conversation today. Of course, we, un, we are adding already layers of code to describe this in different theories. Many people are working in a region that this is for this, the people that have been working on this. But essentially, this is using Green's function techniques to calculate dissipation. And this is fine. They have names. They are called GW, RPA, Bete Salpeter, Kevin. But I have a problem with all those the 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 theories that are the ones that I was using in Oak Ridge, by the way. And I want to explore another form that is more appealing for me from the physical point of view, that is the one that I will tell you today, that is called the Morris Zwanzig projection, a way to project certain degrees of freedom and leave out others in a memory. And I will show you how that is. So, this is what is going to entertain us today. The rest of the talk will be trying to give you a sense of how it is done and what is the advantage of that. But of course, before doing that, I told you that I was doing Boltzmann and that I don't like Boltzmann. Let me show you how to do Boltzmann and why I don't like Boltzmann. How do we do Boltzmann? First of all, we put the portrait in the, in the slide, and then we say, okay, I wanted to calculate this. The way to do a la Boltzmann is to do, a, first of all, a projection. This density matrix, matrix has all the particles in the system. I will do a one particle projection. I will look only at one. All the others are integrated out with this trace. And then, because Boltzmann was living in a classical world, there were no coherences. So the, the density matrix didn't have off diagonal elements, had only diagonal elements that are the occupation of the states. I do that and I write an equation. After I lose the coherence, quantum coherence, I write an equation that is very simple to write. And it has on one side the dynamics of one particle, the dynamics of the occupations, how the occupations change in time, they stream as if they were alone in the system, but they collide with a collision term. The way we write that collision term typically, the simplest way to write it, is to assume that that collision term, it has a relaxation time. That means if I separate the, the system from equilibrium, it comes back exponentially with a time constant tau. 
I can solve that equation now and find that the solution is the perturb is the equilibrium plus something that is linear with the force that I apply and the relaxation time. This is, for example, what we do when we do solid state 101 that we study transport. What we say is we have the electrons in a solid that are in what we call a Fermi sphere. An electric field starts accelerating the electrons. And if there are no collisions, this sphere will accelerate forever. But because there are collisions, electrons that are trying to accelerate too much come back here and I have a displacement. And this is what we calculate with the Boltzmann equation. So we did Boltzmann together. Very simple, right? Classical occupation number affected by an electric field kept constant but disturbed by a relaxation time. This will give us a conductivity when we do the, con the calculation. Remember the equation up there? We put it in the way of calculating a current. How do you calculate a current? You say, how many are there walking that way? We calculate the number they are by the velocity, and that is this sum. That gives us the current of electrons. We replace this by our expression from Boltzmann. The first term is equilibrium. Every time there is an electron going that way, there is an electron going that way, they cancel, gives you zero current. In equilibrium, although the electrons are moving like crazy, they don't have a net current. The other term gives me the, devi the derivation, the deviation that depends on the electric field, current, electric field, what is in the middle, conductivity. So we calculated the conductivity of an electron system using the Boltzmann equation. Great, we have a formula. We go to our friends, we take the relaxation time from some physics that can be uh, an electron scatters with the phonon, an impurity. We do all this cooking of the relaxation time and we can get the conductivity. However, we put this in one of the codes. This is one of the codes, the DFT codes that I told you. We wrote this paper, 2003, how to do transport coefficients. We got, I got the paper, we got some, some people reading the paper. And the only reason I'm showing you this, this is a result from the calculation. You don't need to look at that. The only thing that I want you to look is that this is a very good thermoelectric material. Typically, the chemical potential to get a good thermoelectric property should be close to the gap, somewhere at 300 Kelvin, somewhere around the gap. And I will show you that there is a big problem with this. The problem is when I use this equation, and I have a semiconductor with a conduction band, a valence band, and a chemical potential. Remember, this is the derivative of the Fermi function. It's only different from zero around the chemical potential. It's a little bit of this thing, right? And whatever, remember, if this overlaps with this at high temperatures, I have a conductivity that I see the conductivity. This will be the calculation of the conductivity. But when the temperature goes down to lower values, at some point, the conductivity is zero. So the Boltzmann theory, although I can use it to mimic the conductivity at high temperatures, it misses something that we know from the first experiments we do when we start studying physics. Every material has a residual conductivity, a residual resistivity at temperature zero. And this gives me that the material has zero conductivity, an infinite resistivity, wrong. Wrong, completely wrong, don't pay attention to this. And now, before I lose you completely, I will give you an opportunity. I will show you the end result of my theory, how, solve, how it solves this problem, which is one of the first results we obtain from the theory. And then you can go to sleep until I come back to the conclusions. Because then I will have to explain you how, to, how, how did I obtain that particular um, equation that I will show you, right? So, essentially, we take a material, in this case, another thermoelectric, because I was collaborating with my friends in Texas, the Quantum Espresso, they were doing modeling using Boltzmann. They knew about this problem. I told them, why don't you grab this material that is a narrow band gap, typical with the problem that, I, that you see? You see, this is the calculated conductivity, this is the experiment. So we expect a residual conductivity. We don't get a residual conductivity in the modeling. And then I told them, why don't you try this equation? 
that I just derived with the theory that I will show you in a second. The equation is complicated, but it's very simple to read if we read it together. Because it has ingredi ingredients that we already saw. In particular, this one over tau is new because for me, one over tau will be some memory function that I will tell you about. This is the new ingredient. Tau is not a parameter anymore. It can derive from the theory. But if you look at this, these are energy band differences, optical transitions. They do not contribute typically to the conductivity at DC because they happen in the optic regime. When you have a frequency, and this is zero frequency. However, because of the disorder, we have broadening, and this is a Lorentzian. Now they have a contribution at zero. So this is the physics that I read out of the formula that we obtain from the theory. The physics tells you, because you have a broadening of the bands, and I kept what Boltzmann threw away, the coherence, this is a matrix element between these two bands that was not present in the Boltzmann theory because Boltzmann didn't know about coherence in quantum mechanics. We know about it and we kept it and this is the result. The final thing to look at this is that this only happens at low temperatures because if the temperature is high, these two factors cancel each other and do not give you a contribution, of course. At high temperature, you don't have quantum effects and these are quantum effects, these are coherence effects. They disappear at high temperature and the way the mathematics tells us that they disappear is through these two functions. Finally, graphical demonstration of what this equation gives is that it explains the conductivity up to zero temperature and don't be impressed by the agreement. This agreement is a fitting, right? Because we are adjusting tau. We are not calculating it because what they are using in this case is the same theory they were using to have this Boltzmann, they just put it into this equation and they got the fitting that fits very well. And the fact that it's only at low temperatures, you can see it because the correction is larger and larger and larger at lower and lower temperatures. Are we okay? So if you go to sleep right now, you have to remember that I developed using these techniques that I will explain now, a formula that can be evaluated with the same codes we were using for Boltzmann, but now we can use them to, create, to, to consider systems where we have many bands crossing the Fermi level. And let me tell you, many materials have many bands crossing the Fermi level. This is, a, this is an important contribution. It's not one, one case of one example, okay? So, very good. Now, more on this later, because now we have to learn where did I get this expression? And this will be a tour de force. Physics is done with mathematics. As long as we understand what is the physics that the mathematics tells us, we have to face it. So let me show you some formulas. And I will try to guide you. Any questions so far? Any comments? Any reason to interrupt me? Should I go? Should I continue? Okay, I will continue. So uh, what is my problem with Kubo? The Kubo formula. I will give you a crash course similar to the Boltzmann to the Kubo formula, understanding what it does. First of all, the Kubo formula tells you that if you want to calculate a current due to a perturbation of an electric field that couples to the polarization of your system, the coupling constant is this correlation function that is the conductivity, is the commutator of the current operator with the polarization. Recipe first order perturbation theory in time, you get this result. Not very difficult. We will not do it together. It's, but it's the recipe. You want to calculate the current and you have a field coupled to a polarization to the commutator of the current and the polarization. That's your coupling constant. And it's exact. No approximation, exact. This is the conductivity. And of course, if I assume that I know what we call the Lehman representation, that I know the exact eigenstates of the Hamiltonian with a certain eigenenergy, I can directly, it's a very simple example of evaluating and I get this. And the only thing that you have to look here, these are matrix elements, just potatoes, it doesn't have any shape. Factors, Boltzmann factors, but these 
are poles. These are transitions. So what I have is a sequence of transitions at very discrete levels, probably many. And if I do a larger system, I will have more. However, when I broaden them, I put the broadening by hand. And imagine I want to calculate the conductivity at zero frequency. I have to see what is the tail of all this broadening. So at the end, the broadening that I put by hand is the result of the conductivity that I get from the field. Why? Because of one of the three points that I need to describe well dissipation that I told you at the beginning. Remember, it was an initial condition, but in this case, it's not the initial condition. It was a projection. In this case, it's not a projection. But the problem is I need an infinite system. Remember, the third point that I needed an infinite system, and I cannot calculate unless I am doing theory in very simple models, I cannot calculate an infinite system that will give me infinite delta functions here. So Kubo, to use ab initio to calculate conductivity is out of the question. We cannot use it because we cannot put that many atoms. And let me tell you, I tried, and it, you cannot put enough many atoms. There is always a gap here, and that gap gives you a result that is nonsense. That is essentially whatever you put by hand for this broadening. So end up in this theory that I will describe you today, and it's a, it's a very elegant math with a lot of interesting physical contents, as you, can, as you will see. So let's start thinking about what do we know about quantum mechanics. First of all, the way to interrogate a system in quantum mechanics is to have observables, operators that are self-adjoint. For example, in the case of the pendula, all this infinite pendula, we have the position operator, we have the momentum operator, right? One for each of the particles. But I wanted to look at only one, the central particle. Perfect. I will call that the A variables, and the B variables in my example will be all the other pendula. Actually, I can even put the momentum of P0 outside and look only at the position. That will be A. But in other more complicated quantum systems, A can be a subset of observables that I will pay attention to. For example, in the case of a current in a material, I may look at the current with a certain wave number Q and leave all the other wave numbers outside. Or if I want to see oscillations of the density, I can look at oscillations with a given wave number and leave all the other wave numbers outside. It's my choice. If I want to do an MV center, immersed in a soup of phonons in a material, okay, the variables will be the MV center variables, and the phonons will be in the gray area. Now, my problem is I can always create a projection operator that will serve me the purpose. This is just an internal product. I can create an internal product of operators. If you insist at question time, I will write it down there. But the only thing you need to know is that when you do a projection, what do you do? You have your axis, for example, x and y, and you have a vector, and you want to know the component of this vector v in the x direction. What is the component? You take v dot x, the versor x, and this is the component. What is this point? An internal product. So if I can write now an internal product between two operators, a and b, which is why I'm writing there, what that means, that expression means, is that, that I can essentially say that I can project any operator in any direction, right? For example, I can project it in the x direction, so the projection of the vector v will be vx, which is equal to xv dot x. I am ambiguously putting a dot and a parenthesis to give you the association between these two. So nothing more than what you know from linear algebra. Of course, these are vectors, and those are operators. Well, not, no problem. They are a, the operators in quantum mechanics are a linear vector space. They deserve to have an internal product, and this is the internal product. Why do I want to do that? Because then I can project on the space A 
ignoring B. Can I ignore it? Well, maybe not. Look at this. When I do the time derivative, I will apply my operator, time evolution. That means it will be the commutator with the Hamiltonian. And the commutator with the Hamiltonian will give me operators in A and, unfortunately, operators in the gray area, outside. My system will evolve in time, and it will not only be occupying the states that I want to look, but it will be occupying other states. It's mixing me with the environment. And I want, what I want to do, this is what is happening, right? I started all in A, and I go and I have a spread on B. And this is where I will right now, the most difficult equation that you will see that is trivial to see together, that solves this problem completely. Let me do it. What I will do is the following. This is an exact mathematical equation. Let us look at it slowly. P is the projector on the space I want to see. Q is the complement projector on the B. When I do the time derivative of the evolution in quantum mechanics, I obtain one term that is the evolution in PL. Ah, P maintains everything in A. This is a good term. This is in A. This is outside A, completely outside. This is all Bs. I don't want to see this. And this is a term that remembers the history of my system at every T prime before T. This is a memory. Now I apply this to one of these internal products that I had over there for the conductivity. And when I do that, I obtain this. This is going to be an equation that I can solve for the conductivity that tells me that the time evolution of the conductivity is equal to a time evolution inside the system that I want to see and a memory that appears due to the projection that depends on the variable at every time before T prime, and the coefficient is the memory. This is a Langevin equation. This is a Langevin equation for the correlation function. And let's go back to the pendula, our simple example, what this means. This will be the, the movement of the particle at zero. It will be the movement as if the other pendula was not, they were not there, and this is going to give me the decay that we saw in the particle at x0. That memory was making that sine wave to disappear in time due to the effect of excitations that we created in the particle that we are not looking at. This memory is the same as when you are riding a boat on a lake and you are creating waves and the waves bounce against the shore and come back to you. So your boat is affected by forces that you created some time ago. And because the medium in which you are navigating has dynamics by itself, you cannot ignore it. You have to take it into account in your dynamics, but you have to take it into account without the need of following all the waves. You can just calculate the memory function and you get the equation for your boat, not that it's that easy. So, okay, now we are almost there. The, the tough part is about to finish. But what we need to do now is basically to present you a few actors here that will be important. First of all, this is the natural dynamics. These are the frequencies of the oscillators in the X0. This is the memory. The memory is an interesting beast because it looks like a correlation function, but look at them. When, when you apply the, the Hamiltonian to a variable, it gives you B parts. You save only the B parts. Remember, Q is the complement of P. I don't remember if I wrote it, just in case, I will remind you that if P was the operator, Q was the complement operator. So basically, if I do P plus Q, I have every, all the space. So this tells me that this is the dynamics of the variables that I am not seeing, correlation function with the dynamics of the same variables evolved with a, with a Liouvillian that doesn't go back 
to the stage A. So we, what we did was to cut the Hilbert space in a careful way. The dynamics now is decoupled because I do the dynamics in the memory function without going back to the variables A. That's the trick. That's the, 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 in this equation, we have all the subtleties of this theory. Now, and this is what we did graphically, right? So right now, now you can really go to sleep because you got the general idea. You can remember now, if you go out of this talk, you can go with this theory saying, there is a way to separate the dynamics in two ways, but if I separate the variables in two groups, I get memory. Mathematically, I get memory out of them. This is actually equivalent if you do an equation. Imagine you have two differential equations, dot equal to f of x and y, and y dot equal to f of x and y, or g of x and y. Imagine I solve this, and I obtain a y, a y of t that is equal, equal to some solution, right? And I put it here. That will give me memory. Do the exercise. You will see that the solution of the, the, the differential equation of x will depend on y at every past time. This is the same with this, in a more complicated way. No secret. So now, let's go. Let's do the work. How do I do this in solid? And this is for the experts. So this is, I told you, I give a colloquium always, I do the same. I try to convince you of some general stuff. I try to convince you that it's important, and then I give you the, the thing for the experts, OK? This is the time for the experts. A solid is described by bands. I put impurities that interact with the density of the electrons. I will, every, in every solid, the way to create an excitation is to grab the Fermi C, all the, the occupied states. I put a hole here, and I put the electron there. That is this excitation that I put there, electron hole excitations. These are all my variables. Remember I was telling you about variables in quantum dynamics? We are in the pendula, they always a position and the momentum. In an electron system, the dynamical variables are electron hole excitations. This is what we can move in the system. In a pendulum, we can move the position, we can accelerate it. In an electron system, you can grab an electron and put it there with an operator, excite it to another state. Of course, the solid, the electron hole lives forever. It's an invariant subspace for a given Q. But the impurities mix that Q with another Q prime. What projector will I use? I will throw away all the Q prime and we'll only look at Q. Yes, it's the, ver it's the momentum, it's the momentum of the excitation. Remember, we have wave vectors, essentially in infinite space, the wave function is a plane wave. In a solid, the solutions are modulated plane waves that we call, and Q is this crystal momentum. In the solid, they live in the brilliant zone. I will pick only one Q, and all the other cues go to the memory function and will give me dissipation. And this is what we do with the theory. Now, of course, these are the electron hole excitations. I can mix them and create a charge density. But I can also mix them and create a current. And I can mix them and create many other variables. But because I want to do a hydrodynamic representation of the electrons, that means I want them to behave like water, where the density and the flows of water are the only variables that I will see. I will arrange them like the density is zero, the current is one, and I will use this projector on the Q space, only on one wave vector. In the solid, then, I do the Laplace transform and this goes fast. I'm not trying to you to understand this. If you have been working on this area or you are, have a, some interest in green functions, this may mean something to you. If not, uh, I think, by the way, I think you will correct me if you talk to me later. I think it's important to show these things in the talk because we, have the, we commit the sin of presenting too many graphics in our talks and the students end up believing that physics is done like that. 
with PowerPoint. No, no, my friends. There is a lot of calculations that we need to do. And, and is, I'm not showing you this for you to say, oh, how poor this guy, how he suffered a lot. No. no, 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 no. What I want to tell you is that our work is done like that, doing equations and doing physics like that. But as long as you are able to talk to other people in English about them, you are okay. And I, this is what I am trying to do, right? So, as you can see, in the Laplace, La Laplace equation of this Langevin equation is essentially a Green's function is the inverse of one over the frequency, the natural motion, and the self-energy, which is the memory. These are the expression for these machines. And now I have to do an approximation, because as I told you, this equation is exact, and exact equations are impossible to solve. However, when you rewrite an equation in a way that you like, you can do approximations that are sensible and reasonable. And this is what we did when we rearranged the variables of our problem in a charge density, in a current, and other excitations. This hydrodynamical description will allow me to model the memory function, saying, well, essentially, this is what I'm going to do. When you have a conserved quantity, like mass, or the density of electrons, and you create a perturbation in that quantity, the only way to remove it is to create a current that drags the matter that is conserved away from there. That is the slow process in any hydrodynamical system. For example, if you have magnetization, magnetization can disappear. You can flip a spin, and you disappear it. In that case, it's a fast process, and you don't have spin hydrodynamics in that case. Based on that, we defined a very peculiar memory function where this matrix memory function we say, OK, the charge density doesn't have any memory, but the current has any memory. And we say the memory of the current is the only one I will keep. And the reason why this is an interesting approximation is that I will find equations where I can solve the charge density fluctuation as a function of the charge density fluctuation of my system without disorder, shifted by a memory the current memory, and I can calculate the memory out of an equation where I know phi. When I have the charge correlation and the memory, if I solve these two equations, for example, how do I solve them? I start here with phi zero. I will have m1. I put m1 here and calculate phi one. I put phi one here and calculate m2 put M2 here, calculate phi 2, and you get the idea. Once I get self-consistency, I can calculate the, the conductivity. I told you, this is hard hat, OK? I'm not pretending you to repeat this, but you get the gist. I did an approximation, and I solved an equation in a self-consistent matter, something that my colleagues in the codes, DFT codes, can program. And we did that. We programmed this equation. And I will show you two results. First of all, let's go back to the correction of the Boltzmann theory. Let's derive quickly that equation. If you look at this, I will go very fast here, because what I want to show you is the following. The result of our theory, when we calculate the conductivity, is, remember, these are the equations that I had before. This is the relation between the conductivity and the polarizability. And now, this is our main result of the paper that this theory gave us. If you want to calculate the optical conductivity, you have to know the optic optical conductivity of the system without disorder, calculate the memory, and shift the frequency just by the memory. That's the only thing you have to do. So let me see what is the conductivity of a system without disorder in a solid. Oh, I can calculate that. This is it. You may remember this looks like the Boltzmann, but it has a 1 over z. And this looks like the term, the correction term, but it has the z there. So what I have to do is to shift this z by m. I do it. And now the, the z is shifted by m. And now I take the limit of this z, and I obtain the formula that I show you. 
very quickly, but this is again for you to get this, uh, an idea of how do we cook in the kitchen, okay? And this is the formula. The other, the, this is interesting because it gives us this explanation of a, an experiment that uh, we couldn't model before and we can model it now. But moreover, moreover, now we go and do an implementation in a self-consistent code, one of these heavy codes that you can get and, and, and install in your computer and run a code. And what did we do? We did the simplest metal ever because we have a solution of our memory function for the case of the electron gas. What is the material that is more similar to the electron gas? Sodium. It has a parabolic band that is like a free electron. So we wrap sodium and created a model for the disorder. And we did the calculation, basically, self-consistently, to different levels of disorder. And this is the conductivity. If you do Boltzmann, you get the green curve. You have a metal all your life. Nothing will stop these electrons. But if you do the memory function in basically the free electron gas or self-consistently that is done by exciting in these blue lines, you get a metal insulator transition. A finite amount of disorder makes these electrons to stop conducting, which is a marvelous discovery made by Phil Anderson, 1958, absence of diffusion in certain random lattice. It's only a quantum effect, because if you think about a bumpy road, a ball, classical ball, will roll forever. Doesn't matter. You have to give it more kinetic energy, and you can. In quantum mechanics, no. A finite amount of disorder will completely stop the diffusion of particles in the system. This is the first time that the conductivity calculation gives the metal insulator transition. However, life is not that easy. We did some approximation to this. And although we get a metal insulator transition, the critical exponents of this transition for the Anderson transition are very well known because of the universality theories of critical phenomena, and we don't get the proper indices. So there is something wrong in our approximation. So this is still not published because we do not understand that part. But still, I think it's worth showing that this theory shows a metal insulator transition in a self-consistent calculation with a model disorder for a real system. And that is it. We are done. I hope you understood something and you learned something. These are future things that I am going to do. We are already working on, on the phonon memory function for transport, thermal transport conductivity. That is what Cristobal is doing. It's almost finished. And we are going to do other stuff that you can know in the future. Finally, a comment before I go. In general for the students, but sort of a thought for all of us. Nature is always beautiful and very complicated. Doing computer modeling, we can approach the complications of nature. However, it is only when we grab a beautiful, the most essential features of nature with a few lines of theory, when we are done the proper job. So the, the final thought is simulations describe complexity, but our theoretical work is to make them simple. If you consider simple all the equations that I show you, but in any case, no parallel with Picasso whatsoever, but a thought about beauty, okay? And with that, I finish with a graphical abstract, my email, and I thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. No, the, the number of atoms in the calculation, for example, for sodium is one sodium atom and a model of disorder. Uh, we are summing over a set of points in the brilliance zone that is a discretization we do of an integral. If you want, it's a way to calculate a, an integral with the Simpson's rule, right? We, the, we, we, instead of doing an integral, we do a sum over points. 
Uh, no, 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 no. The E well is, is another beast to some infinite series of electrostatic interactions in, yes, no, yes, no, yeah. Yes, Max, thank you. Yes, actually, the memory function is what gives you the decay, and decay is the arrow of time. You need, a, you need an imaginary part of the memory function that can be seen probably in, uh, let me see if we are too far away. So e essentially in the, in the Langevin equation, you can see that the memory function, uh, it will appear up there, up there, here. So uh, in this uh, memory function here, this is the part that will give you, so if you want to solve only this equation, you will get oscillations. The way not to get oscillations is to get here a real part that will create an exponential decay. So essentially, imagine we have Ah, uh, that, that will be an interesting thing to do. Imagine we have a typical Langevin equation. And you say that uh, dv is equal to an integral dt prime m t minus t prime v of t prime, right? This is roughly, without the term, the oscillating term, is roughly the Langevin equation with memory. Now imagine that the memory is very short, right? And this can be approximated by something that is tau a delta of t minus t prime. That means can be can doesn't need to be a delta, but can be some peak. And in that case, this will be dv equal to tau v. And this is the solution of this, is v is e minus t over tau. I think I have a minus sign somewhere here. Yeah. So, as you see, the memory function, when it is short, it gives me an exponential decay. That's the connection between the memory function and decay. If it is not short, it can produce, instead of exponential decay, it can produce what you saw in the exact solution of the oscillators. There is a memory function that can, you can calculate exactly for the chain of oscillators. It's a very trivial example. And you will see, for the first time in your life probably, a memory function. And how that mathematically, when inserted in this differential equation, gives you this decay. What do I have in the memory? All the variables that I put outside my scope of, of view. Yes, anybody? Yes. No. It depends, it depends on the sign, depends on the form, but it typically will give you decay if you put the proper dissipation mechanism. You can have a resurgent dynamics and then decay, but I mean, it's as complicated as you can have the, any problem, right? Um, but it typically, if you put the proper dissipation, it will. Yes, right, yeah, yeah, sure, yes. Yeah, yeah, causality is written in the Kubo formulation. Remember, we are using the Kubo formulation, and essentially what it tells you is that J of T was equal to minus infinite up to T of DT prime, the chi of T or the sigma of T minus T prime electric field at t prime. That means the current at t is affected by all the electric fields at t prime before t, but never after t. This upper limit in this integral is causality. So that's the yeah. Well, causality doesn't mean the arrow of time. Causality tells you that no effect that you produce today will affect what happens to you yesterday, right? That's causality. The arrow of time means that we can distinguish past from present. That means that if suddenly 
all the books in my bookshelf, you, you, you see two pictures. One, all my books like that. And the other, all my books on the floor. You can say, oh, this was before and after, right? Unless I went and put the books back. But that doesn't matter. What I mean is, the arrow, the arrow, of, the arrow of time, the arrow of time is a, is a dynamical equation of motion that when you take t to minus t, it doesn't go back to the same solution. It always gives you decay. And in a sense, it's given by terms like this. I mean, there is a, if, if we had more time, there is an interesting relation between causality given by this. You can, you can write this as a, as a theta function, if you wish. I can integrate to infinite. If I put here dt prime theta t sigma t. So this means that in the fact that I have this jump at time zero, will give me a non-analytic non behavior in the math. The relation between the math of analytic behavior of these correlation functions and the frequency is very rich and subtle. But if you want a quick answer why this theory gives you the, the error of time, the error of time is inscribed in the shape in time of this memory function. Thank you. Yes, please. Well, I, I didn't talk about the coherence. Say. Well, no. Actually, um, in the case of this uh, formula, So first of all, um, using this formula, I can calculate the here. If I know phi, I know the conductivity. I calculate phi with this. So I put the disorder, calculate phi, and this is giving me the broadening. In certain limit of weak scattering, I will calculate this m, and it will agree with the disorder of a first-born approximation, but I do not put it by hand. It comes out of my hypothesis of disorder. But I can put it by hand if I want to do a cheap estimation. What I did in this case, for example, when we show the results with the, the, this, uh, this, what we did here was, yeah, we put the same value we were using here just to show that this formula gives you the residual conductivity. Right? In this case, we put it by hand. But I can also calculate it as the imaginary part of my memory function, calculate it self-consistently. OK, super. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Well, the problem is I, I cannot ignore them. I have to include them in the dynamics in a way that is uh, that I am not describing them one by one. If you see what we did with this analogy of the hydro, hydrodynamics, it's the same. When you, when you want to model the surface of water, you can model it molecule by molecule, but it will be very hard. It's probably better to write an Navier-Stokes equation which actually can be derived from the memory function theory. The Navier-Stokes can be derived. And what you are doing is that you are describing every water molecule by a density of them and a flow of them. So I in a sense, you cannot ignore the degrees of freedom. You have to treat them in a sensible way, throwing away details that you don't want to see, keeping details that affect your dynamics. Thank you very much. Thank you.